todos que nos assistem ao vivo. Good morning, everyone who is watching us live through the IOC channel on YouTube. Good morning to all our guests who will take part in the first international symposium on innovation and research of the Oswaldo Cruz Institute. Starting today until the 19th, the symposium will promote discussions on new strategies for the increment of research, technological development and innovation at Oswaldo Cruz Foundation, bringing speakers and agencies and academic centers from Brazil and international ones devoted to new methodologies of governance, science, technology, scientific and technological prospection, managing knowledge and innovation. Developed for internal and external researchers, technologists, and postgraduate st students, we will talk about issues such as the past and present of innovation at the IOC, uh, international cooperation strategies for the innovation in healthcare, challenges and lessons learned brought by the pandemic of COVID-19, technology and research in healthcare initiatives from Fiocruz focused on innovation program, Innova Labs and Innova Fiocruz and perspectives in PDI. And now to open our event, our inaugural table will be formed by the Vice President of Research and Biological Collections, Rodrigo Correa from Fiocruz, on behalf of the President, Nizia Trindade Lima, the Vice President of Production and Innovation in Health, Marco Aurelio Krieger, the Director of the Osvaldo Cruz Institution, José Paulo Gagliardi Leite, the Vice Director of Research Biological Innovation from Osvaldo Cruz Institution, Jonas Perales, and by the Ambassador of the European Union to Brazil, Inácio Ibanez. For the inaugural speech, I'd like to give the floor to the Vice Director of Technological Development and Innovation. Jonas Perales. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me well? First of all, I would like to thank everyone this is the first international symposium on research and innovation of the Osvaldo Cruz Institution. This is one of the events in, that we are uh, organizing in order to open the celebrations of the anniversary of the Osvaldo Cruz Institution. I have a problem on my computer. I am having problems. And on behalf of the president of the Osvaldo Cruz Institute, I'd like to thank you for inviting me. Nizia Trindade, unfortunately, is unable to be present today. She had another meeting, but we count on the presence of Dr. Rodrigo Correa and Dr. Marcus Krieger, who are vice presidents of the Osvaldo Cruz Foundation. And they will participate directly today. I would also like to say hello to our directors who have been fully involved in the organization of this extremely important event. And Dr. Ignacio Ibanez is also part of our inaugural table. He's a, one of our keynotes. And to us, it is very important to celebrate this event because it actually will be part of one of the last events organized by our directors at the Osvaldo Cruz Institution. I am part of these directors, our management actually will end this week. So this is the last event we organized during this management. And another very important thing for this event is that, as I have mentioned before, it has been organized jointly with the 
presidency of the Osvaldo Cruz Foundation. We work very closely with the presidency, so we believe that this event should be organized in this way. We are an institution who really uh, works very well together, and we believe this is very important. So I would like to thank all the members who are present at the inaugural table of our event. This is what I had to say. And we do hope we will have uh, an amazing event. I am sure it will be because we have high level uh, participants today. They have a lot to add and they work very focused on the development of research and innovation. I wish everyone an amazing and a very profitable event. Good morning, everyone. Let us now begin our event. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Perales. I will now give the floor to the ambassador of the European Union in Brazil, Ignacio Ibanez. Good morning. It is a great pleasure to participate on the International Symposium of Research and Innovation of the Osvaldo Cruz Institute. I would say this is very emblematic because certainly it's the first one of many events we have to come. Thank you for inviting me. This highlights the intensive partnership between the European Union and Phil Cruz on many fronts. I would like to say hello to all the representatives of the inaugural table. I have interacted with some of them before, even if virtually Dr. Krieger, we had a meeting with the member states of the European Union, Dr. Rodrigo Correa on the bilateral committee for science and technology in March of this year. Today, he's representing Dr. Nizia Trindade. I would also like to Compliment Dr. Osvaldo Leite, Director of the Institution Osvaldo Cruz, and Dr. Perales, Director of Research for the Institution. Europe and the world face many health challenges, huge challenges, which should really be faced in order to ensure everyone's right for, to a long and healthy life. This is a moment when we are facing many chronic diseases and also external environmental factors like uh, climate changes, infectious diseases, all those things are major global threats. Europe is investing in research, technology and innovation in order to develop solutions to overcome these challenges. The return of this investment will be finding new ways to prevent diseases, developing better diagnosis and more efficient therapies. How can we take on new technologies to promote health and well being? The European innovation and research in healthcare consists in working together beyond our borders, sharing knowledge in order to improve the healthcare system and finding answers to the challenges, the most efficient answers you can find. It is satisfactory to see uh, how long we have moved forward. We have been facing major challenges like Zika, COVID-19, and also working more and more closely, focusing on issues like the One Health that recognizes that human health is closely connected to the health of animals and the health of the environment. We have also been working jointly in multilateral initiatives such as Globidar, a network which focuses on giving a quick and efficient um, answer to threats and through the coordination of the research agency focusing on prioritary actions the new research and innovation program for the European Union, Europe Horizon, has as its subject infectious diseases. This is considered a priority to the understanding, prevention, and response to new outbreaks. Brazilian and European researchers can continue to cooperate in this item, intensifying cooperation 
with Instituto Oswaldo Cruz in the Science and Innovation Park from the region of Aveiro in Portugal. I do hope we can intensify even more our cooperation and move forward, working together, searching for innovative solutions to improve our health and the health of our entire planet. I'd like to thank you once more for inviting me, and I'd like to wish everyone an excellent symposium. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ibanez. Now I'll give the floor to the director of Instituto Osvaldo Cruz, José Paulo Galliardi Leite. Good morning, everyone. Dr. Inácio, it is a huge pleasure to count on your presence here today. Looking at the last names of our colleagues who are here today, especially Krieger and me, we can see that our ties with Europe come from many centuries before. We may be from when Brazil was discovered. And this partnership between Mercosur with the European community is of extreme importance. It's a huge pleasure to count on your presence here as an ambassador of the European community, and it's an honor to Phil Cruz and to Osvaldo Cruz Institute, this partnership. I'd like to congratulate you on your words, especially when you said we have to think about a globalized world from the economic viewpoint and also from the healthcare viewpoint. We cannot think about a world which is highly developed without focusing on animal sanity, public health care, and the environment. My friend Rodrigo Caorrea is here on behalf of the President Nizia Trindade. And she's in a meeting with the Ministry of Health. Maybe Krieger can explain it better. My colleague Krieger is the Vice President of Phil Cruz for production and innovation in healthcare. And my colleague, Jonas Perales, vice director of the Institute. I would like to show you a few slides now. I will now share my screen and I will try to be brief. I believe you can see my my screen, right? This first international symposium of research and innovation is now open, closing the activities of our 120 years of the Osvaldo Cruz Institute and the Osvaldo Cruz Foundation. Phil Cruz can be considered a very important asset of the Brazilian society. This event was only made possible thanks to a partnership we always had since the beginning of our management with the presidency, especially now with the vice presidency of production and innovation in healthcare. Our the representative is Marco Krieger today. Thank you, Marco. The Osvaldo Cruz Institute and the GESTEC NEET system, which is connected to VPPs. So thank you very much to VPPs, Just Tech, to the Vice Director of Technological Development and Innovation of IOC, here represented by Jonas Perales and by Claudia Cano, our NIT IOC, represented by Aline Moraes, our colleague, the team connected to VDDIG, Department of Journalism, the sector of events, Oliveira and our colleague Thiago, and special thanks to our speakers, to the participants of this virtual event. Unfortunately, it's virtual, and to the Nas National Council of Research and Technological Development, connected to the Ministry of Science and Innovation. We do have to struggle because the budget of C. Uh, and PQ has been drastically reduced. And talking about research and innovation, we have to think about strengthening CNPQ, and we have to train human resources and strengthen our institution quickly. 
even considering this speech of our colleague uh, Ignacio, as ambassador of the European community, and our colleague Magali, director of the Osvaldo Cruz House, should give us the history of the Osvaldo Cruz Institution and Foundation. When we think about the federal phytotherapic institution and the experimental pathology institution, we began trying to fight bubonic plague, uh, the yellow fever and other diseases. We can think that in 1901, the description of Anopheles Lutzi, the beginning of medical entomology, we started innovating back then. The Manguinhos application course in 1908, this was the first postgraduate program in Brazil. This was the cradle of Brazilian innovation. And in 1909, the description of Chagas disease, the first scientific publication with the memories of the Osvaldo Cruz Institute. In 1942, we had the eradication of the urban yellow fever. In 1970, we could not for, uh, forget the Manguinhos massacre where many Brazilian scientists were taken away from their activities by the military dictatorship and nothing has been proved against these brilliant minds. And the first disease eradicated in the world was smallpox in 1970. And in 1980, we started uh, studying the dengue epidemics. In 88, we isolated HIV responsible for the AIDS virus. It was also a major pandemic, we can say. In 1994, OPAS introduced the free Americas free from poliomyelitis. Brazil had a very important role here in the vaccination campaigns. In 2014, as our colleague, Dr. Inácio mentioned before, we had studies with chikungunya. In 2015, Zika with important scientific contributions, not only for Fiocruz, but also institutions of research from Brazil in 2017, the yellow fever epidemics. And unfortunately, beginning in November of 2019 until the present moment, the new coronavirus SARS-CoV-2 responsible for COVID-19. And now we can think about it as a thrombotic viral fever or why not a thrombotic viral syndrome. Unfortunately, today, Brazil has uh, the number of deaths because of COVID-19, which is very close to Anam, uh, Anamindua city in Paraná in terms of population. Then Brazil has 435,000 deaths. So unfortunately, we are progressing with uh, uh, an absurd number of deaths in our country. Brazil has only 1.8% of municipality that is superior to 400,000 people. Then today we can think that we are decimating the, uh, the city of Campina Grande in the north of Brazil from the map of our country. The Institute of Valdes Cruz Institute has got 72 research laboratory uh, involving 350 micro products of research. And our researchers and our technologists have contributed to over to 2,500 uh, articles that have been published. We have published 36 books also published 346 chapters of books and also uh, technical publications that total 649 that are related to reference laboratories and biological collections. Nowadays in our institute, we have 180 research groups that is connected to the Brazilian National Research Group, CNPQ. We have important partnerships like Swiss Snacks, with Maria Conti, we have established this agreement um, before this pandemic. 
That's why we were not wearing masks. And now more recently, we have established a partnership, which is very important, as Dr. Inaiso has uh, mentioned, with the University of Aveiro. And now with this symposium, you have the presence of colleagues from New Zealand. And we also have partnerships with Australia, among others. In Germany, for example, we have a partnership with Sweden, and we you also have other important partnerships. Then we understand that this partnership with the University of Aveiro, with the support of the European Community Embassy support, we will have more opportunities for our future. In terms of innovation, because of this unfortunate syndemics, we have to adapt in this moment of difficulties. Then the partnership with the Vice Direct Board Directory of Research Interactive with Claudia Cana and also with Media City Moraes and also collaborators. And on top of the Department of Journalism with the representation of Raquel and and also Ednaldo. We have created a technological um, uh, window about um, COVID-19. And there we had 26 research projects that are connected to another project of Fiocruz. As probably Rodrigo, you mentioned that uh, in terms of this new innovation uh, instrument, trying to pursue new horizons for partnerships. Then we have created a cafe uh, of innovation now in, that was held in March 2021. 15 projects were uh, showcased. 11 projects were pre-selected by the health ministry to have financing, two for Farmanguinhos and two uh, by the Institute of Research of Paraná. And two technologies will be presented in terms of the SARS-CoV-2 um, kit, as well as the platform for educators, which is platform CHA. And now we have to think about innovation in partnership uh, with the public government and also PPPs. We have a very important role of the consultative um, board of uh, Instituto Oswaldo Cruz. And they are very important for research, innovation in our country. Investing in science and education is real investment. It's not about expenditures. Last night, SBPC President of the British Society for the Progress of Science, Maria, Dr. Moreira, has uh, updated the current scene that we have got, and we have to work really hard so that we do not have contingencies this year, and then this fund will be released so that we can enhance our science, technology, and our innovation as well. A very critical role that is developed by SBPC and all the scientific societies that are affiliate and the other scientific societies of Brazil on top of the science and technology institutions and the Brazilian Academy of, uh, of Science to advocate science and to advocate education. Well, with this introduction, I would like to thank you all that are in this panel, everyone who are participating in this event and everyone who are participating in the organization of this event. So may we, ha may we have a great event. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jose Paulo. Now I give the floor to the Vice President of Production, Innovation and Health from FIO Cruz. Marco Aurelio Krieger. Good morning, everyone. It's a great satisfaction that I have to participate in this opening panel. But I feel really glad to be in the midst of friends, as you all are. 
Dr. Inácio, I also consider you a great friend of ours. And we have had some meetings that have been productive. And first, I would like to give, to make a small correction. Rodrigo Correa, he represents himself because he was already a member, which is very important in our panel to participate in this event, but also he's supporting us, representing the vice presidency of the of your cruise. And then, um, Rodrigo will be representing uh, he himself. He'll be speaking on his behalf and also the presidency of uh, Fiocruz. I'll be brief with you. I will have to follow a technical visit that will take place here in the, in the foundation, but I will be here with you. And tomorrow I will be with you as well. And I have great satisfaction to have the chance, to have had the chance to participate with the team of Mr. Paulo, and then we could make this financing and we are together. And I'm really glad that this event is, has come to bring a very successful management with partnership that consolidates these so important symposium like this one. But I was already very engaged with Café with Innovation about COVID-19. And now with this symposium, I'm really glad. You know that I have worked on my master's and doctor's uh, projects uh, as a member of IOC. And I would like to issue all a great symposium to all of you. And I'd like to say that I will be together tomorrow and following these, day, these days. So congratulations on the, to the, on the board and the organizing committee to have organized such an important program in this symposium. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Krieger. Now I give the floor to the Vice President of Research and Biological Collections, Rodrigo Correa. Good morning, everyone. Mr. Paulo, Mr. Ambassador, uh, Ignacio, and also Krieger. I would like to congratulate on Jose Paulo for organizing such event, which is very important. And I'm really sure that our president feels very honored and happy with this event that is being organized with IBPP and COC. President Luis has been mentioning the importance, Nisia has been mentioning the importance of this event in, within Fiocruz, pursuing new ways of um, having products, be them uh, from innovation addressed to pharmaceutical drugs or biologicals, but also pursuing products that can bring a social important impact. And these are called products, but they can be methodologies and methods to, to bring incremental um, um, innovation that would bring a great impact on the Brazilian um, uh, health system. Nowadays, we are experiencing a very complex moment with COVID-19 because it has been impacting all scientific technological uh, department. And Dr. Inácio would show clearly the need of cooperation uh, for the Brazilian health system. Um, and he has brought our attention to this point. What is happening today with COVID-19, it can be a future reflex based on our lack of control to the environment and also human health and animal health. Um, the human health is, and animal health has been very close to the activities that we have developed. Recently have held a meeting um, um, aiming at the care of animals with the federal police and there is a great concern in terms of care of animals and uh, the environment and interaction between both parties. 
With this, we have discussed a number of activities with the research of our institute and with the pursuit of alternative methods uh, with the use of animals. That's why Fio Cruz is actively operating through its, its system called Pragma of alternative methods. And in uh, the network of a few crews of alternative research have been actively participating in it. There will be uh, the program called Innova Labs. Uh, and, and this program was organized with APCB and it pursues to have innovations within Fiocruz. It happens because Fiocruz is within the innovation system, which is fast, disruptive, and incremental. We had a gap in this process. So with these two vice presidencies and the leadership team of our, the leadership of our president, we're gonna have a new system. And this system, uh, has led us to a significant series of technologies that are within our laboratories that we could uh, bring to the Brazilian health system. And as Marco always mentions, uh, we have a chain of development. And the only share that we think that was missing in our work was this active pursuit, this active search that we have had in the last years then Dr. Inés, so in terms of Europe and with regard to all the study that has been carried out and the presence of few crews in Aveiro University, I think that the innovation system can grow even more. And we can show that to our colleagues from Europe uh, in terms of what few crews have been developing in terms of disruptive incremental innovation. And for us, it's a great honor to be able to work with Europe in such development which is even faster in terms of innovation within uh, for instance, Valo Cruz uh, Institute. And we have observed that more and more innovation within Fio Cruz has been growing so much. And what was missing was a system that could uh, make the researcher understand where to place this innovation. And today the system really works properly. And under the management of Dr. Nisa Tendaji, uh, she has been brought this point in terms of the need to pursue innovation, create a system of Innova that covers all the innovation chain of uh, crew so that the researchers uh, can bring this uh, product to the Brazilian health system and to the whole global um, population if this is the case. That's the aim. I'd like to thank you all on behalf of President Nizia Dindrad, and I'd like to congratulate on the organization of this symposium. And I'd like to thank the ambassador, uh, Mr. Inacio uh, Ibanez, for the participation of the European Union uh, with uh, Fundação Osvaldo Cruz um, Institute. So thank you so much. And congratulations, Mr. Paulo and Krieger, for the organization of this symposium. Thank you, Dr. Rodrigo. I'd like to thank the participation of the members of the opening panel. Now, I would like to invite Carlos Eduardo Rocha to give continuity to this event and to moderate the first panel Innovation in IOC, the past and the future. Good morning, everyone. First of all, I would like to once again thank all the um, all the members of the opening panel and the partners that helped supported us to to promote this event and to make this event come true. The presence of your crews and all all the opening panel members, especially, I would like to thank the whole team of innovation team of the Osvaldo Cruz Institute for the organization of this initiative on top of the uh, international cooperation team members. Once again, I'd like to thank Dr. Inácio Ibanez, the ambassador, ambassador of the European Union in Brazil, to Brazil. Thank you so much for the many initiatives between the European Union and 
for the Sons of the Cruz um, Institute. So once again, to start our first panel, we're going to have a panel that we will talk about the past and the future of Osvaldo Cruz's Institute and the initiatives in terms of technological uh, innovation. And we're going to have three speakers in this morning. The first presentation will be conducted by Dr. Magali Romero Sa. Dr. Magali is a researcher of Osvaldo Cruz Foundation and also vice director of research and education of Casa Osvaldo Cruz. And she will be talking about uh, IOC Innovator since its foundation. So I'd like to thank the participation of all and Dr. Magali, who is going to start uh, her presentation. You have got 30 minutes. And at the end of these three presentations, we're going to have an important space for questions and answers uh, throughout our international event. So Dr. Magali, you have the floor now to perform your speech. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's a great satisfaction to be here with you. And I'm really glad to have had this invitation. I have a special care for Osvaldo Cruz Institute. And this institution is very important to all of us. To talk about innovation in terms of Osvaldo Cruz Institute is very difficult task because it have been very innovative since uh, its foundation. And Jose Paulo was showing the timeline in terms of important contribution that the Institute has brought to Brazilian society. Then thinking about on how I could talk about this and then about being repetitive and thinking about the such important activities like the Chagas disease and the fight against yellow fever and you, um, discoveries and leishmaniosis, I'd like to bring a presentation that would show the importance of Osvaldo Cruz Institute in another area, as it has been said right now. We are thinking about the integrated activities and thinking about the role of animals within this context. And thinking about that, uh, Osvaldo Cruz Institute has always been innovative. A text called COVID-19, a notion, an ally against the virus. The text emphasizes the main role, the very important role in the performance of texts to detect the presence of COVID-19, as had already been done for the diagnosis of AIDS and SARS. The test that was developed from an enzyme isolated from bacteria found in marine hydrothermal uh, springs by researchers at the uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, emphasizing the relevance of oceanographic research and innovative exploratory research, both for the knowledge of biodiversity and its interactions and for the discovery of new resources and potential uses for health. Now in 2021, we are in the decade of ocean science for sustainable development. The institution was a pioneer in the studies of hydrobiology in Brazil. The Osvaldo Cruz Institute has always been at the forefront of important studies of marine life, its interactions with each other, with the environment and the impact caused by human intervention in the environment. I will today highlight the important role of Osvaldo Cruz Institute in the oceanographic studies of marine biology. I have a presentation here and I brought some slides I'd like to show you. As I speak, I will show you the images. Let's begin. I'll begin by showing you the location of the Osvaldo Cruz Institute at the Manguinhos Farm on the edge of the mangroves of the Inhauma Inlet. This was one of the factors that contributed to and facilitated the development of research on marine life by our institution. To get to the institution as a KLG, as a member of the first generation of the institution, described the difficult journey. 
researchers had to reach the institution. He says in the muddy strip, periodically invaded by tides that surrounded much of the land, there were uh, green groves of mangroves among those tentacular roots and a varied fauna of bizarre crabs on whose high canopies perched high white herons and gray socos. When they were not fishing in the shallow waters or in the tranquil environment of this Bay of Rio de Janeiro, they looked at those birds flying Uh, you're not uh, changing your slides, Dr. Magali. Uh, what should I do? It was on the first slide. Okay, now you are on the second one. Thank you very much. I will show it to you soon. So this description from Ezequiel Diaz is very interesting. These are old pictures I'm showing you. They show very clearly what Manguinhos looked like. The institute had been built already, but it was very difficult to reach the campus. They had a boat. They had to go by boat, reaching this provisory deck. It was very difficult to them to reach this institution. Another thing they could do was going by train. However, the journey by train was very tough. They had to walk up to the hill and it was not easy at all. The journey uh, was uh, in the midst of a mangrove. So it was not easy at all to reach the institution. One more slide, this is the Guanabara Bay. It's also interesting to see the Institute is located in this terrain. And here is the Osvaldo Cruz Institute with the headquarters, but you can see the deck where they used to arrive. Can you see far on the top? Later, Avenida Brasil was built and all the scenario changed quite a lot. I will show it to you later. So, the main focus was on the researches um, done by the institution, especially on marine biodiversity. It's very important to get to know pathogens. They studied that and they made many, many new discoveries. In 1908, when Adolfo Lutz was incorporated to the institution, he was really interested in studying the large population of crustaceans that populated these mangroves along the Inauma Cove. He was a free doctor, he helped the fishermen, and in turn, they helped him to collect specimens of crustaceans that he could study. Lutz was mainly interested in the association of between these crustaceans and mosquitoes, those very small mosquitoes that inhabit marshlands. He was uh, collecting all that material and he focused on research. I will not focus on him too much. And later, another researcher, Eugenio de Oliveira, continued analyzing all that material collected by Lutz. He also had a very important studies on marine biology. Of course, the studies on protozoa and causes of Chagas disease, Leishmaniasis, and other things were the focus of the research of the institution. We're looking to know more about different forms of life and different in habitats. And the young researchers of Manguinhos were highly interested besides the interest of Lutz study the institution, many uh, visiting scientists. I have a picture of visiting scientists. They focused on researches in the area of Manguinhos, in the marshland. They really were interested in um, studying the different animals that lived in that place. And Mark Hatchman from the Infectious Disease Institution decided to uh, 
studied this area and published many works related to that area, especially focusing on the different protozoa they found. They had relevant works on inventories from protozoa found in the region. All that work was has been published. It's in the memories of the IOC. If you would like to uh, know more about it, you can have access to all that work published in 2010, 2011. And Aristides Marques da Cunha uh, started working with these two German researchers, and they uh, studied many species of protozoa. And another important researcher, José Gomes de Faria, he's sitting here, you can see that, he is in the beginning. Gomes Faria, Carlos Chagas, Osvaldo Cruz, Figueiredo de Vasconcelos. This is Lutz, here he is. And in the end, Parreiras Horta. This researcher, Robert de Faria, had a very important role in the studies of microbiology for the institution. He is well known as a methodologist, but Gomes Farias, I will now explain to you, had a very relevant role in the studies of microorganisms, protozoa, and others. One interesting thing that will happen is that the Brazilian marine was really interested in knowing more about the development of a fishery and knowing the environment as a whole was very important. So in 1912, they founded the Institution of uh, Fishery. I'm showing you Gomes de Faria. Here he is, you can see him on the picture. He's the third one and he's one of those important characters. I'd like to focus somehow on him. It's important that you know more about him. This is a very lousy image, I apologize. I took it from a journal and I couldn't find nothing about this Institute of Fishery. Why am I talking about it? Because all the material from this institution has been incorporated to Manguinhos. In 1912, the Brazilian government promoted some measures related to the institutionalization of fishery uh, coordinated by the Ministry of Agriculture. You can see here in this picture, well, this building no longer exists. It, it was demolished, but that's where it was headquartered, the fishing inspectorate. And they invited a, a national researcher, Gomes Faria was our younger researcher who worked in Manguinhos, and he was responsible for this session of the zoology office, and he was nominated by Osvaldo Cruz. Gomes de Faria, the one I have showed before to you, is here in this slide. This is one of those expeditions organized by the institution. Gomes Faria was responsible for Piauí and Sierra states. So this is one of his images during the expedition. He had joined the institution in 1906 as a medicine student, as many others. And after graduating, he remained at the institution and kept working there. He's here with other important, renowned researchers of the institution. He kept working and counting on the attention of Osvaldo Cruz. He does very important work and he focused on important researchers. Aristides Marques da Cunha developed important work on microplankton and plankton. And this work was published when he went back to the institution. This research of the institution was made available by the Marine. This is José Bonifácio. He liked uh, to do research in the high seas. Uh, I'm mentioning him because he was very important to the institution. So after three years, in 1915, this inspectorship was extinguished because of the lack of funds. 
Unfortunately, they had a marine biology station at Praia Vermelha. It also did not work out. It was not successful. They had collected lots of material. However, they were unable to keep it. So it only lasted three years. They had collected amazing material, but unfortunately, the institution was closed. Osvaldo Cruz decided to protect this material inside the Instituto Osvaldo Cruz, and part of it went to the National Museum. Gomes de Faria went back to the Institute, and there they created, not officially, but they established a hydrobiology session. And that is when the aquarium of the institution was built. Uh, and all researchers got together to work on it. Aristides da Cunha had already worked on that. And Olimpio da Fonseca, who was already doing relevant work with protozoa, they worked together with Gomes de Faria at this hydrobiology institution. Here is the aquarium. Can you see? This aquarium was connected to the bay. The sea was in front of the building, so uh, the water was pumped into the aquarium. So the researches on plankton was, were conducted by the researchers of this session, and they also worked in Mar del Plata in Argentina. The, Brazilian marine made their lives easier so they could uh, use their boats and collect material. And then they released many publications. We had several publications. And then the memories of those Valdo Cruz institution, there was a publication on microplankton of the Rio de Janeiro Bay, microplankton of the meridional coasts of, uh, coasts of Brazil, and Gomes de Faria and Marcos da Cunha. also worked on it. I could not find a better picture of him, but he was one of the major researchers of the institution. He had a very, very relevant role in Brazilian science. These researchers have published many things. They published many uh, studies on plankton, microplankton, on the Bay of Rio de Janeiro and the Meridional uh, coasts of Brazil. They emphasized the importance of the work of Gomes Faria. He was a pioneer in systematic observation in Brazil. He did work that was previously uh, undeveloped, and it was extremely important for the development of cure of related to diseases that could affect fish, crustaceans, and other organisms that served as foodstuff for the population. So what happened then? This hydrobiology session of the Institute during the 20s and 30s had problems with the functioning, especially because of a specific period where the institution had lack of resources could not employ new researchers. So with all those problems, this initial work, which was very strict, serious work, became less prominent. They did not count on support. Olimpio da Fonseca left, so they faced many problems. Another important thing was the Avenida Brasil, which was built, that aquarium that pumped uh, water from the sea, lost its function and functionality. It was a major loss to the institution. And during this period, the work done by the institution became less relevant, but it has not ended, quite the opposite. Olimpio da Fonseca, who is here, in 1935, recruited a young physician, Leugene de Oliveira, to become his assistant in the parasitology chair. 
1937, two years later, he took an application course at the Osvaldo Cruz Institute. I also apologize for the quality of this picture. I took it from an old magazine. And this year, he joined the institution in the hydrobiology session. And then with the reform promoted by President Getulio Vargas, Legene worked with Henrique Aragão, who was always a huge champion of marine research. At the beginning of his career, he went to Europe and he worked in many labs and stations of marine research. He was extremely interested in this area. And uh, he decided uh, to do work in Rio de Janeiro, and he took with him this young doctor who was working with him. Aragão was an expert in several areas, but Leogene focused only in marine biology. And then what happened? Avenida Brasil was built. This is an old picture. I apologize once again for the quality. I took it from a very uh, important publication on, on Brazil Avenue. This is not an excellent picture, but you can see the Institute on the back on your left side. And all that marshland was dried. The scenario has really changed enormously. And then what happened during the management of Henrique? Aragrão, we had a major problem the, with the monkeys. And before the management of Henrique Aragão during the 30s, they counted on the government support to make the island of Pinheiro and turn it into a station. At this station, they mounted also aquari aquariums. In 1922, this station is to be an area of 12 hectares where they had some uh, trees and orchard. And over here, you can see that it's in front of the Institute. And this picture is here showing. So at the end of 1992, it was an area of about 12 hectares with vegetable gardens, with fruit trees, a small landing pier in a poor condition and fish ponds. At the end of the decade, it hosted a colony of rhesus monkeys uh, imported from India and uh, um, Brazilian species destined to research on yellow fever and then the manufacture the vaccine against the disease. This island only had the rhesus monkeys and aquariums. And then what happened then? In the management of Cardoso Fontes, we wanted to transform it and to create an hydrobiology station on this island. With this support, uh, it happened with the management of Cardoso Fontes. And in this session, um, uh, we could have good results. Legion de Oliveira, this young researcher, was uh, managing these studies. And then we could, uh, um, uh, the build, could build some laboratories. And we developed many things on the island. Look at the map, the four plants of this island. That was hydrobiology station, as you can see. And there was a small museum that we were developing uh, from the material that were collected and they were deposited in this museum. And here's another image, which is quite interesting. You can see an aquarium of this island, a very close to the Institute in the background. You would have the, uh, the floor of uh, Brazil Avenue. And Aragão, in the management of Henrique Aragão and his successor um, from 1943 to 1949, from 42 to 49, 
They provide Hyderabad station with necessary resources and means of, uh, of work. And according to Fonseca Filho, that is very important to Institute of Oswaldo Cruz, he had these speedboats for research and one was important from England by director Henrique um, Berupere Aragon and the other built in one of the shipyards in Niterói, in addition to a small um, speedboat. And they performed many research using these boats. Oh, we don't have registrations of these um, boats, but the maritime uh, excursions were carried out with the support of the Brazilian Navy. We also have the Oceanographic Brazilian Institute that was created in the 1930s by the Navy. And in 1945, for four, um, there was uh, an, a cooperation agreement that was established with Henrique Aragon. And in this agreement, they were very interested in um, maritime biology research. And of course, this research was still being developed by our institute. And with this cooperation agreement, we had the Navy, uh, or the Navy, Brazilian Navy in researchers participating in that. So it's quite interesting because you can see here this picture and this boat was used by the researchers to raise information in the Guanabara Bay. And they went to until Ilha Grande to perform researches. What about José Gomes? And this oceanograph, the Institute in Brazil had José Gomes as a great active member in terms of research. And José Gomes Farias as well, they were really engaged. Of course, there were some other research, researchers being dedicated to this initiative and also in partnership with the Navy. And this partnership was very strong. In 1944, they had this collection of data and in cooperation with Aragon and the research that you would use these boats they would use this boat to perform research in September. In 1948, Aragon invited Pierre Drach, a professor of the Faculty of Science, to perform other research using this uh, ship. Because Aragon, at that moment, um, he was involved in international cooperation, but always he was always thinking about the development of Brazilian uh, research and he invited Pierre Drach to spend six months in our institute and then organize, uh, organize an expedition. And this ship was provided by the Brazilian Navy and they go to Spirit Santo State. They invite researchers from the National Museum and also researchers from the science department from the University of Sao Paulo. Then this group of researchers starts participating in this uh, program. And this material uh, was collected uh, to have new species. And I show you the relevance that it has got. And this French researcher, Pierre Hedrash, he gives guidance to the Brazilian researchers and also he starts, uh, they started these diving courses. So they were really enthusiastic about this. So this image shows them wearing the diving suit. And then he teaches and foster submarine uh, research uh, with this group that was working in, on the oceanographic research of our institute. Then it was organized um, by Pierre Drach, that was with Aragon uh, on top of researchers from Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro. And then he came here in 1948 
to spend six months in the Institute. And he trained several scientists and presented new techniques for observing marine life. It's what is quite interesting to mention here that, that we were discussing the union of these islands to form that archipelago in front of Manguinhos so that we could gather all the islands to create the, the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. So it was being discussed. And then Pierre Drash participated in the discussions with the researchers. And then they said that the Pierre Island wouldn't be affected, it wouldn't be impacted, you can continue the research with hydrobiology, no problem. And then with his guidance, it helped us to reestablish the facilities on the island. But of course, then later the pollution in our Bangunabara Bay was immense in the future, the research had to be uh, uh, withdrawn. Well, another researcher came here. Look at what we are saying, guys. That's the Fundam Island on the left-hand side, which was gathered with this small island, and then the Pinheiro Island was isolated on the lower part of the screen. And there was a great discussion with Aragão and directors of the Institute, because the the principal of the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro wanted to uh, also include the Pinheiro Island. But at that moment, there was a great pressure so that this island would be also be withdrawn and incorporated in this complex, this archipelago. Another researcher um, joined, and um, when Fonseca Filho will replace Aragon because Aragon had to leave, stop his management, and Fonseca Filho was um, succeeding him. Something very important was the course that Jean Paulo has shown in terms of innovation. And Fundação Oswaldo Cruz, I mean, Oswaldo Cruz Foundation innovated a lot in terms of hydrobiology course. So we had over 70 students that were enrolled and brought a great impact for, uh, for everyone that wanted to study marine biology. Well, Eligene de Oliveira, who developed the work in terms of biology of the works of this island, I'm going to leave a picture here for you to see this uh, work on this aquarium on the Pinheiro Island. Unfortunately, we started seeing the effects of pollution on Conabara Bay. And then uh, he analyzed many works, published many relevant work by 1958. Um, those so clean waters were already polluted in the degradation with the construction of um, the university city impacted a lot of work of the islands. But there was another work was developed um, with re regards to um, something related to the pollution that was taking place in the Guanabara Bay. In 1958, uh, the first article was published about the pollution on Guanabara Bay. And then he continues his research uh, in the hydrobiology station of the Institute until 1977. But because of the pollution, there was it was impossible to continue the work because of the pollution uh, of Guanabara Bay. So it was impossible to continue with the research. And then he would dedicate his time to only be a professor in the Federal University of Rio Janeiro. Marine research had a great impact based on the, the, the work that was developed by him. So for those who are interested in this field, it's very important to do this research. And we have many researchers from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro that works with the impact of the pollution on Guanabara Bay, who also works with Luisa Tau, that 
would also work with Lejeune, and they left important works in terms of the studies of crustaceous um, microorganisms and the pollution of Guanabarape. But it didn't stop there. Research continued. Although Lejeune de Oliveira was not uh, pertaining to the Institute anymore, but before that, until still in the 1970s, these researchers were working with the Navy and they were supporting some work that were developed in with the Navy. And they were working directly with the Brazilian Navy. And these were research that were developed by uh, Rudolf Barth, who was a zoologist. And then he collaborated in the implementation for several years in the development of the biological research laboratory of the Navy Research Institute. But look, look at the importance of Rudolf Barth, which was an expedition that he um, carried out in Trindade. He participated in two expeditions in 1957 and 1959. Then it shows the importance of the Institute within an international program which was International Geophysical Year Program. And of course, we're going to, Regina Horta will be talking more about the importance of this work. The, the International Geophysical Year Program was a work, a collaborative work, which was very important for history. It's important to highlight this point because now, um, it's important to show that we were already started international projects that are very relevant. Between nine, uh, the 1st of July, 1957 and December 31st, 1958, this program was carried out. It involved the government and scientists from around 60 countries around a set of investigative actions for the knowledge of the planet Earth in various physical aspects. And such included topics such as selectivity, northern lines, uh, atmospheric physics, latitude, longitude, accuracy, oceanography, meteorology, among, uh, among others. The idea was initially launched in 1950 by the American scientist Violet Beckner and successively um, received the support of several international institutions and UNESCO. And Bond was invited to participate in the expeditions made by the Navy. And over here, I show two images of Rudolf Bart. And these pictures were published um, in a an article by Monica Bart, her his daughter. And it was a, a journal of um, Osvaldo Cruz Institute. Bart and uh, made important fauna of floristic and climatological observations. He diagnosed problems and presented suggestions whose pertinence was collaborated, corroborated by scientists dedicated to the study of the island in the subsequent decades. In observing the very aspects, a key issue became evident to Barth, which served as the cutting thread of his impressions about Trinidad. The island was facing a rampant process of deterioration that needed to be controlled. The firm and urgent measures demanded by Barnes to solve the very serious environmental, environmental problems of a remote island found an echo of the successful actions of the science in the Navy. Let's now talk about the scientific exploration of the Antarctic continent is carried about is carried out today with an important participation of the Oswald Cruz Institute, which is the forefront of strategic projects and of enormous relevance of the development of Brazilian science to the five laboratories to, that integrate Finanta. Had the innovative uh, research been developed by researchers from IOC, INI, and ENSP, who are also part of the program who will have significant impact on pure and applied science and will contribute decisively to the training of human resources and scientific advancement. 
to our country. The opportunity of Olive World Cruise Institute to participate in this scientific expedition to Antarctica and take a step to express its interest in the vast uh, territories uh, here too, unoccupied, which as reported by Olympia da Fonseca, was lost when José Gomes da Faria could not accept the invitation of the French marine scientists and explorers, uh, Jean-Baptiste uh, Charcot, who participated in his second scientific expedition to Antarctica in 1908. And for Olympia da Fonseca, it was a great loss to explore all these things. And right now, it has become a reality. And I wrap it up here. I believe I spoke too fast because I was concerned with the timing, but later I can bring back some topics in the Q&A session. And then I'd like to thank you once again. I hope I have contributed show by showing the relevance of this area that is so important, uh, that is considered, uh, recognized by UNESCO um so thank you so much oh, i would like to thank you thank you for conducting it for your presentation and i would like for having this historical journey at by covering all these aspects that were very relevant both for the Brazilian scenario and also with the corporations with france among other countries thank you magali and for sure, we're going to have uh, great questions from our dear colleagues and participants. And now to continue with our panel, I would like to, uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Dr. Carlos, Carlos Gadelha, coordinator of the Center of Studies, Strategic Studies of the Field Cruise Presidency. So thank you so much, Carlos Gadelha. And now I'd like to thank um, the organizing committee to have brought strategic actions um, from futures in terms of science, technology, and innovation. So, Dr. Carlos Garibelia, so now you have the floor to conduct your presentation. Well, I would like to thank the Oslo Cruise Institute over 30 years of cooperation, collaboration with our institute, I can say that I feel very satisfied to participate in it. I'd like to thank Monica Oliveira, my colleagues from GESTEC, from communication, all the colleagues from the presidents, Rodrigo and Krieg, especially President Nizia, as was mentioned before, had a, an outside meeting and Carlos Eduardo Rocha, who is coordinating here our table, the session. And I'd like to say it's a huge pleasure to be here taking part in this event. I believe what I have to say is quite connected to what Magali has said before, because one of the major uh, and important things of Fiu Cruz is align tradition and innovation. We can only respond to the challenges of COVID-19 and of the pandemic facing all this difficulty and tension because we have more than 100 years of history, as Zé Paulo mentioned. And I will try to challenge you, let's say. I did not prepare a specific presentation for this symposium. Last week, I had one for the Center of Studies of IOC. I'd like to do something more freely so we can think about the future, how we can update our institutional project and how we can rethink our institution so it can become stronger and more connected to the Brazilian society. I brought here a presentation. I'd like to share my screen now. And after our discussions, we can uh, focus on a few items. I will try to keep to the time I have available. Mm. I received the message here. Let me try. One of the things we learned 
to do during the pandemic in remote work is never to lose calm, especially with uh, our events. Carlos Eduardo, can you see my slide? Yes, it's perfect. It's working. I will try to explore a future view and at the same time, a vision that reaffirms our values and our commitment to the Brazilian society and to the global society. Trying to go into this dimension, past, future, this tension, and at the same time, this opportunity our institution has because of our long history of contribution to the Brazilian society. I begin here with a definition, even to show everyone that we have different types of economists. Some of them are thinkers, major thinkers. Salso Furtado is one of our major economists. He didn't receive the Nobel Prize because of colonialism. We will talk about it more. He defines very clearly, even better than Marcia Sen and other major thinkers, what the economic development is. It's a process of social changes. Development is not only about doing more of the same, but it's doing things differently, updating projects, setting new challenges. And Celso Furtado pointed out during his whole life, human needs, we should meet human needs. He died saying that a country that in, was industrialized, but is unable to meet the most basic human needs is not to be considered a developed country. So we should focus on human needs. This transformation happens because of the differentiation of the productive system in a broad sense, Pro industrial production, services production, and introducing technological innovation a process of change and transformation which is behind this view of development in order to meet human needs. So innovation is not an end in itself. Innovation is relevant when it is connected to meeting human needs. When it's used to advance knowledge, which in the future will contribute to human needs, social needs, and the need for knowledge, which is a human need. Science is a value. This is our view at the Strategic Study Center. The new science, the future of science and innovation at the same time should consider the values, social needs and the intrinsic value of knowledge as society without knowledge is on its knees. And also environmental needs should be considered. So I decided to bring the following. What does, what, what is a sovereign nation globally inserted? I have brought some knowledge of the area of politics, of economy. The first sovereignty is that of the currency. Currency is a, representation of social wealth. If I do not have sovereignty, for example, to organize public expenditures, if I cannot fund science and technology, if I cannot give 5 billion Brazilian reais approved by the National Congress, well, I would like to greet all the scientific community who is here. The industry took part but if I cannot, on behalf of an adjustment policy and austerity policy, have sovereignty on the value, on public expenditures, I do not have the capacity of developing social policies, technology policies. I am not a sovereign country. I do not have a sovereignty on my social value, which is represented by the currency and by the resources we can apply and use. Sovereignty is the qualified productive basis and knowledge intensive. The COVID pandemic did not leave a margin. We do not have enough to produce 
masks, ventilators, we do have enough for diagnosis, but we know we lack funds. We need more. We don't have sovereignty to develop future vaccines. Those who do not have qualified sovereignty cannot consider themselves as sovereign nations, even to insert themselves globally. The third issue is involved in the view of the state and of the government. Sovereignty for public policies to have the unified health system to give universal access without accepting that one on one side of the wall people have 15, 20 years less life expectation. And on other parts, like we see in the shanty towns of the Rio de Janeiro in Sao Paulo and in the hinterlands in northeastern Brazil, in the shanty town which is located very, very close to Manguinhos, we can give many examples. So sovereignty should be used to develop social policies and territory. The national territory should be protected. This is a, the classical definition. But until we have national policies and capacity, this is essential for international cooperation. Here at the IOC, we know it. We can cooperate with Africa, with Latin America, with vulnerable populations, because we have knowledge. If we have the capacity of developing national policies in science and technology, fifth, and maybe the most important one, the mother of all sovereignties, is the sovereignty of knowledge. The sovereignty of having science, technology, and innovation is a key factor. As Celso Furtado mentioned, the key thing in society is knowledge. This makes transformation possible and an adaptation to future challenges. This is all done through knowledge, technology, and innovation, and also equity. I like to say that the mother of all inequalities is the inequality in science and technology. This is the generating flow of every inequality that pervades society, territories, vulnerable populations. Those who have no knowledge, no technology, no innovation, remain on their knees, as we are seeing during this pandemic. And in this perspective, the relation between health and development is within the DNA of IOC. I'd like to greet Dr. Kura. He deserves an homage. I feel touched when I talk about him. He always dealt with the social perspective along with so, uh, science, technology, and innovation in territorial development in the most needy regions of our country. So I had not prepared this homage to him, but it is very important to focus on the social dimension, the economic dimension, and social science, technology, innovation, and the environmental dimension. They are all inherent to development and health. They are all interrelated. Many people from UC, beginning with Osvaldo Cruz himself, have uh, carried all this together. They never separated the social dimension from science and technology and the environment. And here it is very important to mark the perspective we work with at Few Cruz and at the strategic uh, subject development. We have to think at the same time of the transformation in the economic world technology, innovation, science, and the social world, the environmental world, and public policies. We can never advance in healthcare policies if we do not have a strong foundation of science, technology, and we do not have economic and productive autonomy. That's what we are facing now. We're living that. We have the productive system, which is powerful in healthcare, but it is totally inarticulated. Brazil has the largest a universal system. We create 8 million jobs in healthcare. Attention, ladies and gentlemen. If we count direct and indirect jobs, healthcare creates more jobs than the whole unemployment in Brazil. We create direct and indirect uh, 18 million jobs. And then employment in Brazil, which is a huge tragedy for families. There's nothing worse for a family they have in the parents looking for jobs and being unable to work to take care of their own families. 
health creates jobs and we have to help the Brazilian society to see it more clearly, to understand how important that is. Today at Fiocruz, Cruz, we have a representative from the Ministry of Economy, from the Ministry of Health. I hope this vision is impregnated. We have the chemical and biotechnical system, all the knowledge in biology. We have the electronic the foundation systems where we have respirators, readers, uh, electronic equipment, artificial intelligence, and lots of equipment for additive technology, and services from primary care at the hospitals, diagnosis, tests, and distribution. So in this, uh, health distribution system is being revolutionized by the connectivity. The new vaccine was developed with the use of big data in record time. We used artificial intelligence, big data, advanced biology, genetics. There was a huge convergency. All the information and connectivity system allowed us to accelerate by four times we developed the vaccine in record time. Usually it takes at least four years. We did it in less than one year. Let me see if I can show this clearly to you. This shows Brazilian imports. We advance in the access to health care during this, this century, and our imports have grown to more than $15 billion. If we count software, and things that are not considered health, but are health, they are connected to health. You are researchers, you know you can not do research if you do not have computers. Math, if you do not have inputs that are not necessarily considered as belonging to healthcare, we have a huge deficit, which is not $15 billion, it's $20 billion actually. So it's equivalent to a whole budget of the Ministry of Health. It doesn't create jobs, and it does not incorporate knowledge developed in Brazil. We have a huge dependency of 90% in the APIs, active pharmaceutical ingredients, 90% of pharmaceutical inputs, active pharmaceutical inputs. They're responsible for therapeutic and prophylactic effects. They are all imported in the major universal system in the world in terms of population. This in the area of active pharmaceutical inputs. So where is chemistry? Where is biotechnology? During the pandemic, the imports of ventilators increased threefold and we buy lousy products, low quality products. The Brazilian DNA is not a good one. We have bought to imported ventilators, the good ones were removed from airplanes that were coming to Brazil, and we bought low quality products, very low quality products. I like to say that those who do not have knowledge and don't know how to build things cannot even buy properly. The pandemic has shown that, besides other things that we know exist. Individual uh, personal protection equipment, so important to our population, overcome imports with $1 billion. In terms of Brazilian reais, almost 6 billion reais in products that are totally within the technological horizon. Everything is complex in healthcare. Even a mask, a face mask, needs to have electrostatic mechanisms to protect people. It's all highly complex, but it, all this is within our technological horizon. We see the vulnerability of the unified health system. More than 100 countries have established barriers to export products. The globalization, we talk so much about globalization, they closed their doors to the less developed countries, all developed countries. Every one of them have put barriers to the export of healthcare products amidst the pandemic of COVID. More than 100 countries have done it. I wrote almost all of them because we have a few exceptions. However, I don't know any countries that have not established barriers to export life products, ventilators, face masks, equipment that helps in the epidemiologic surveillance. They have been uh, vetoed. They cannot be exported to Brazil. And within this context, how do we find ourselves? We have 
opportunities, and the IOC is a part of this opportunity we have in Brazil. We can overcome this situation of dependence, and this, we need to face the fourth technological revolution. We are now undergoing deep transformation. This image became very famous. It's from the New Yorker magazine, but I brought it here. See, the robo looks like a person, has legs, has a head, but this robo is giving some money to somebody who is totally excluded from society. This could be a device of uh, big data, and this could be a vaccine drug reagents. What we are seeing in the world today is an inequality in COVID, where high technology, the high capacity, human skills are not reaching uh, the population. And when they do, they reach the population as a compensation, as a handout, a pittance to the poor. And this is unsustainable. In a highly technical world, a capable world, with people who beg for a dose of vaccine, it is uh, shown as a coin in this image, but we could read it as a vaccine today, as a reagent, as a face mask and many other essential products. I also bring this image to show you the importance of having technological knowledge in a country such as Brazil. We see this image from Amazon, Google, Watson. They identify these soaps from needy communities who need to use this soap. They identify it as food or a piece of food. They get this one on the right side, right. Those who develop algorithms are highly educated people. This sentence is not mine, okay? It's from uh, the work in Facebook. Developers are white, highly educated. They come from high income countries located in few regions of the world and they do not recognize cultural differences. The algorithm when it's developed outside of the social and cultural context creates this type of inequity. It does not recognize a basic sanitation product like a soap this is a basic product for prevention and quality of life. It's a soap to wash hands and the poorer communities need it. And here we show this synergy. I am daltonic, I will not mention colors here. Well, so the darker it is, you have more uh, more complex activities in terms of technology. And Brazil is lighter here, as you can see. So the more ore and soil that you produce, we see the intensity of knowledge in terms of technology is not so produced. And then this, you can see that this kind of activities are concentrated the same way. That's the same image now for patents and the just tag team already know about it so the darker it is the more patents we have so we can see inequality worldwide look at what is interesting here this inequality has to do with the human development and inequality it matches so if you think about this adjusted to social inequality in within each country. So you can see that uh, it's a very similar map in terms of the human development index. So, but I bring you an optimistic message to wrap it up because I have to prepare for the future. Look what's happening in the current moment. The parents, parents in self are blowing and many, 90% of patents are led by only 10 countries. Today's patent is the reflex of inequality and richness in terms of technology. If things continue like this, 
you will have a world that's even more unequal in terms of knowledge and innovation because the constitution of patents and the pace the because the patent does not only reflect upon the innovation but patent also reflects on the private appropriation of knowledge and when i have got this for 20 years and the pace of innovation is so fast the patent can represent the exclusion of the possibility of development of countries that were uh, were left behind so which reflects on innovation and also on restriction as a monopoly to stimulate innovation but when the innovation time is reduced uh, so the balance of this monopoly is even stronger stronger well this is a map that we see in terms of knowledge the size of the wall the ball is the uh, the, the 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 investment that people make in that the governments make on education and you see here in terms of science look what is interesting here i show you this initial uh, image that um shows that the social world has to do with innovation technology and those countries that have um, brought on have have based their economy on or products extracted from nature they have um have this big gap if compared to countries that have gotten specialized in technology by technology among other sciences and here i can see the translational space that connects uh, the knowledge that is in ioc in fio cruise and then the social development you will need to have a economic productive complex that we will allow to absorb this knowledge to generate um, development which is so social and economical then we need to have an economic and technological structure in the country so that we can absorb this knowledge and then generate social and economic development and this world has been revolutionized by 4.0 technology and if we do not demand these technologies and if you don't don't know how to get into this world we're going to reproduce exclusion dependence poverty and ignorance in our country well we have a great concentration of uh, vaccine production and uh, it means that there is a symmetry in terms of access that is not compatible uh, with what we need to do. So 54% of the vaccines are acquired by 64% of the population. It has increased. The Oscar ceremony that I love seeing, I got really ashamed. Everyone was vaccinated, everybody's rich, everybody was protected, they could they didn't need to use to wear masks. But if you look at our side, the reality is totally an axiomatic, totally different asymmetric situation. That was a scene that would show the inequality in our world, which is related to knowledge and really related to an unequal distribution of technological scientific capacity. And maybe with people's uh, people say, I'm not going to patent the vaccine, but this inequality in terms of knowledge and um, science and technology generates this inequality in terms of access. I'm sorry to, to interrupt you. I have just talked to the principal. Would you please? Uh, conduct the pace of a presentation at a slower pace because he's a bit delayed. So feel free to spend more time on your presentation. So that was the first intervention I have ever had to let me know that I can stay longer. So I will spend more time. 
because I was a bit concerned on my time. And then we can open for a Q&A session, if that is the case. But thank you so much for interrupting me. The idea is the following. Uh, from this context on, we have the following. This image here that shows that science and technology world is associated with a social and economic and environmental world to the world of life. The world of life is where the people have friends, they eat, they drink, they have a family, they go to school. So what I'm saying is the following. If the world and technology world is vulnerable, independent, the world where we live, interact with the environment and with people will be a world which is unequal and more difficult to live in as we have here in Brazil. Because dramatically, 120 million people, they have a food unsafety. And it means that uh, people don't know if tomorrow they will have food to eat. So no other science will have that. I'm not talking about basic sciences here, okay? No scientist, no one who is committed to knowledge cannot look at the social reality of people that live um, in their territory, in their country, and in our planet. This relation between the world of science and social world has been so evident in terms of this uh, inequality indicated. And then we have a great challenge, and it's good for the institutional policies. I have to think on how we can work on a system, for example, the health system that would cover medications, ventilators, vaccines, basic uh, services, health services, uh, big data. I, I don't care. I don't provide the basic health service like I did decades ago. But now we have a great density of knowledge and technology. Um, because we will not have universal basic health service if you don't have knowledge to deal with these uh, technology that involve that. And because of that, we have to articulate research policies. Um, and I would like to make an appeal to to IOC because the because the research policy to increase knowledge is very important. It's decisive because research policies has to create in the long term a process that to generate products, services, along with innovation incentives. And it's important to say that this balance is critical and Fiocruz has been very uh, active by creating programs for innovation, but simultaneously having um, having the strengthening of research as an essential uh, goods, uh, an essential product for society. The root of development, when it does not take place, the root of inequality um, occupies its space. And if we do not work with on all these measurements, we can even have a strong research, but this research will not uh, connect to innovation, will not have capability of acquiring puts so that it can um, make uh, commercial policies be viable. And that's a model of public policy that is behind the technological demands and its basis for a few crews to still play this game. But if we do not triple, triple this bet here, we can even be excluded from the vaccine world. 
But over here, we have something which was possible to be done. The articulation of public institutions of science and technology in the, in the technological park and with technological partners to develop products that are provided to the unique Brazilian health system. And then we provided medications for cancer, medications for chronic diseases like renal diseases. And these technological base of biopharmaceuticals, and that's in those, upon that base for the influenza vaccine, Butantan could work uh, on the COVID-19 vaccine. But we are still not participating uh, on the leadership group that would develop the new products and vaccines and even the newest practice of health because the concept of innovation it's much wider than what is applied to products and services and now i bring a discussion to all of you which is this challenge for science maybe you would think i would talk about the complex technological complex and innovation but they have a great challenge for science with regards to the future that is coming to us fruit of the technological revolution and scientific revolution that is coming to us here we have a great challenge in the colonial time sorry to bring this um, ancient time to us but what defined the colonial agreement among the countries that um, were domaining the world and even the relationship between Brazil and Portugal? What was your colonial agreement? Brazil was not allowed to have a currency today. We have a constitutional amendment 95 that does not allow us to spend on science, technolo technology, and, and innovation and health. There was, it was a prohibition to have a manufacturer at the time. And today we have a great job in terms of the evolution of um, the industry in Brazil. It was not allowed to have uh, rights, social rights and democracy. Democracy in Brazil uh, could resist, but the social rights are at risk we know that we just need to see what is happening and uh, with to hunger in our country it was prohibited to have a sovereign insertion in global geopolitics we need to know how to deal with the global disputes china united states europe asia so that we can be inserted um with uh, an international cooperation that would explore the diversity of interests and diversity strategies to pursue a more equal world. It was not allowed in now colonial agreement to have universities. Do you know about that? It was prohibited to have universities. And look at what is happening to our uh, state owned universities then you have to have a re-reading of this relationship between Brazil and Portuguese from, and now we want to see what is happening right now. In practice, we need to have independent public finance and having industries, social rights and having sovereign insertion and also having universities. And even we have in difficulties to have a nation which is more independent. In this context, we are going through a huge transformation where hyperdigitization and hyperconnectivity invades people's and machines, um, people's lives and machines. I'm not using big data only because not only about having data, but we need to have the ability of processing this data and transforming this data into information, knowledge, and learning. This is decisive data uh, without the capability of having intelligence to transform big data into big science and education. It's good for nothing. That's the great challenge that a few crews in the Arizona Institute have got and how to get into the fourth 
a revolution of technology. Today, the lab, um, the labs today, I can see mathematicians, programmers, biologists, doctors, but I also see other types of, uh, another type of, a profile of lab. Sometimes you don't even see a vial uh, in a lab because we're because we have technologies that are really present. We cannot perform biology without advanced technology, and technology and um, uh, biology and genomics are revolutionized. Um, but we need to have the great commitment with ethics in humanities. I mean, the technified world of technology and biology more and more should be closer to the world of ethics and humanities. Because at the end of the day, the technological scientific knowledge should dialogue with the technological and scientific knowledge to organize uh, and uh, construct an, an ethical and humane society. And all these spheres of life are being revolutionized. The production of knowledge, the sphere of goods and services, production, and also the relationship of individuals and society. The idea of Phil Cruz and IOC and their colleagues, how do we think about producing knowledge um, in such a way that it will not impact negatively society. And then you have to think, how can we can change from uh, uh, something which is fashionable, just a fad into the way, because the way changes from inside out. How can we advance in terms of transdisciplinarity? Because in biology, in, science, in exact sciences, human science and history, we cannot have this uh, progression without transdisciplinarity. We have to deal with the fear people have, the imprisonment that science has got, the science of the past blocking the science of the future. This is something that we have, we have to face this barrier. And how is the knowledge of the past can be amiable and open doors to the, its transformation and change. We have a big risk of barbarism uh, of the um, wide spreading of knowledge because the wide spreading of knowledge can generate exclusion. And let me bring that, that image because now I have more time. And this exclusion, this is the exclusion of knowledge, the exclusion of the 21st century that we have to think and we have to know how to perform science that will take into account the science exclusion. Science seen as a transformative project that can free humankind so they can have a friendly knowledge and not destructive of nature how can we leave our comfort zone as a provocation a challenge i say leaving the exclusive culture of peers to that of criticism self-criticism and dialogue freeing knowledge to go into the creation generation of things that are necessary for our collective life, getting rid of uh, preterite algorithms, that these algorithms do not recognize even the soap we use, and forming networks and alliances between different fields of knowledge, and the, the let, uh, legitimizing uh, science and technology and information. That's the role of every scientist, in my viewpoint, those who work with basic sciences. And the context of fake news, disinformation, and denial of science, they have the ethic and moral obligation of showing the value of science to the society, even in order to understand more clearly their doubts, their future options, since we do not have only one option for the future. In truth, and here I move toward the end of my presentation, 
we have now a change in our social life in the way we do science and technology, how we organize our territory and how we organize the welfare system in healthcare, a new system of surveillance, for example. How do we get around, not only with more cars, the relationship with life, family, social networks. Families are being checked. The relationships of between parents and kids that have totally changed. Our kids are always inside their computers. They are inside social networks, but they are not focused on human relationships, family relationships. This is getting lost in the current context. This is also highly connected to the impact and influence of new forms of knowledge developed and encouraged by our society. So it's a challenge related to how we can care for people in this collective environment without denying science, technology, and innovation challenge for a care, which is at the same time uh, humanized and innovative. This is how, at the same time, we can allow a, an accurate health care, public health care, which does not uh, leave aside human personal contact and humanization between people, which is so essential to health care and to the quality of life. Actually, we find ourselves in a divide between the fragmented, individualized world where the biological knowledge can be used only to separate the health of each person belongs to that person, or a world where biological knowledge, human knowledge, and social knowledge exist. And we can organize a more intelligent and precise, accurate action without forgetting healthcare and life as a solidary and collective system, strengthening universal systems, and not this anti-ethical segmentation, this barbaric situation we see in the world of vaccines. How can we not lose the humanist, social, environmental perspectives using the whole power of the fourth technological and scientific revolution, which is ongoing now. We cannot follow into this risk of social segmentation. Since I have some more time, I'd like to say the following. When we get into a plane nowadays, well, before the pandemic and before social distancing, we saw 10 different classes, 10 categories. Beforehand, we had three only, executive, business, and economic. Now we have 10, according to the distance allowed between passengers in healthcare. We cannot do so. We cannot say that aspirin, the whole plane has access. Vaccine, only one third of the airplane. Immunotherapy for cancer, only those in the first lines, executive class. This is anti-ethical, it's immoral in healthcare. It goes against everything that Phil Cruz and the Osvaldo Cruz Institute have championed in life. So how do we use technological knowledge without creating a divided society? I'd like to make an analogy of what we have seen. The fragmentation, stratification, and consumer goods such as a plane ticket, and how can we go inside a social system committed to the collective, to the society? How can we connect science, technology, and innovation to the demands of the society? This is something completely essential. From this viewpoint, healthcare is production, innovation, knowledge, growth of the GDP, and health is social rights, environment, citizenship. We need to overcome this restrict view, which opposes the right to life and health to the economy. As a major economist says, the economy should be in the back seat of history and being useful, and it should never be in the front row, in the front seat. And health generates production, economic development, and rights at the same time. In truth, as I already mentioned to the Center of Studies, and I'd like to mention it again at our symposium, we should think about how together Phil Cruz, 
IOC and the community that's present here today. We should think about the future of scientists and how we can enter the fourth revolution without giving up on moral items that give universal knowledge and access to health. How can you think about new forms to organize science and the challenge of transdisciplinarity, the connection of biomedical research of humanities? I know it's a tradition of the IOC, I remember uh, Virginia Shaw is a good example of this connection. Flexible organizations according to scientific challenges. We cannot remain locked inside a lab or a department forever without any flexibility to face problems that come and go and get updated and that demand flexibility in the organization scientific disclosure and legitimacy, as I mentioned, this is extremely important. How can we think and act focusing on a few crews of the future as an exemplary institution which connects the universal access for technology and innovation and sustainability in a national and global dimension? The main issue I mentioned here is how can we think about science, technology and innovation and bring it into the model of society we want to have. And through dialogue, to conversation, listening, how can we have a democratic consensus toward a project of change where science, technology, and innovation might be the most decisive factor? In truth, I would like to close with the sentence by Celso Furtado, where he says that under development, just as the god Genus looks to the front and back without a defined orientation. This is a historical problem which cannot spontaneously lead us to anything but a social catastrophe. 120 million people with uh, food insecurity, that is catastrophic. Only a political project supported by the consistent knowledge of social reality can break this perverse logic. And I'd like to bring your attention to the role of knowledge. Only knowledge, science, technology, and innovation can really, really help us to break this perverse logic which we have been watching in our country and globally. Thank you very much. I am available here to answer any questions you might have. I do hope we can keep talking for as long as necessary. Thank you. Thank you very much for being careful with your presentation and time. Thank you very much. I am available here. Thank you very much. More, having more time is great. It's excellent. Thank you very much, Carlos. We will have excellent questions at the end, I'm sure. Thank you, Carlos. Now, continuing. Let us continue with our panel. We have the presentation from Dr. Paulo Jorge Feiteira, Dean from the University of Aveiro, Portugal, who will talk about the internationalization of research, international experiences, specifically from the University of Aveiro. Thank you very much, Dr. Paulo Ferreira, for your presence and availability. Dr. Paulo, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I share my screen? How long do I have? 30 minutes. Very well. So we are ready now. We can begin. First of all, I would like to greet and thank the members of the initial panel. The President Nizia Trindade from Fundação Oswaldo Cruz, the Vice President, the Director of the Institute, the Vice Director of Research, Mr. Ambassador, Ms. Marisa Gonçalves, and 
I'd like to thank the panel which I belong to, Carlos Rocha, Magali Romero, and Carlos Gadelha. I will talk about a few topics briefly. First of all, about the history of the University of Aveiro and then the academic community of the university. And then let us talk about the researches, the school and postgraduate programs, which are essential, and future directions, which is extremely important to take into account. Let us talk about the history. The University of Aveiro was founded in 1973. It had three main pillars, internationalization, and it is now internationalized. And it's important, the relationship we have with the whole region, the University of Aveiro has always been taking that into account and giving it importance and the organization and processes University of Aveiro was established without a library, without a single book. We built not only a new university, but a new institution. That was the idea. And now we have a European university in the sense of the challenge faced by the universities of the European Union. It integrated one of the first funding proposals, and it uh, is a member of the European Consortium for Innovative Universities. This exists since 1997. The University of Aveiro is one of the founding members. The profile of the members is similar. We have research intensive universities in the consortium. We bet firmly in entrepreneurship, in innovation, in technology, science, but also in social sciences. And we consider innovative ways of learning and teaching. And we are also engaged in uh, national and international exchanges. The view of the ACU University for the next years is the following. It's a university where learners, teachers, and researchers cooperate with the local uh, communities, cities, and business to solve real life challenges and problems. Some of the key words we use is interdisciplinarity because, uh, of course, we have been facing interdisciplinary challenges, social programs, challenges such as sustainable development, the European society really uh, gives a huge importance to that in micro credentials. This is a term we can talk more about later. The consortium is spread out through Europe. We have two member universities and one associate, which is in Mexico and Monterrey. In Europe, we have Aveiro, Barcelona, the National Institutes of Applied Sciences, Trento in Italy. We have one center in Holland, one in Denmark, Dublin in Ireland, in Scandinavia, we are also covered, and in Lithuania. This gives you an idea, a summarized idea of uh, our integration. The academic community counts on 15,000 enrolled students. The last uh, uh, national exam of access offered 2,565 positions. We had a bit more. And the number of students located in the first options was according to the number of positions. And we all uh, positions were fulfilled outside of Lisbon and Porto. We have a dimension for social actions. We served almost a million uh, meals in 2019. In 2020, due to the pandemic, we had a lower number. We have the highest number of 
beds, 1,142 beds at the university in 16 different residences. This is essential for internationalization. International students and researchers have more difficulties coming to Aveiro if the problem of lodging cannot be solved. And we were able to divide students in order to promote the close contact between uh, cultures and languages, breaking barriers and promoting integration. The academic community is formed by approximately 90 nationalities and its globality, including students. But we have approximately 90 nationalities. We have more than a thousand professors, researchers, we have more than 400 and technical personnel, admin and management professionals, we have 730. The research career is the uh, greatest focus of our institution. And we have other nationalities. The most represented ones are Spain, Germany, Russia, India, United Kingdom, Brazil, China, and Italy. Due to the language proximity, we can explain some of these uh, characteristics. And here we have a map of the dis dispersion of the workers in our community throughout the world. Of course, most of it is concentrated in Europe, but we have some of them all over the world. This is what has been happening during the latest years. And now let's uh, talk about the postdoc doctoral school. International students are a reality. And we have many international students and we have different programs. We have uh, programs in total or degrees given by two universities. They have uh, agreements between them. And we have the doctoral programs from the University of Aveiro, which is the largest number. And we have international degrees like the DOMAR program. I will give you an idea of this program a bit later. And then we have the internationalization incoming students who come to the University of Aveiro for short periods of time for complementary studies or researches. And we have visiting students. The DOMAR program is an international program based on the excellence campus DOMAR. It's from uh, the University of Aveiro, Uminho and Utah, and three universities in northern Spain. In Vigo, Santiago de Compostela, Coruña, we have some associate members in uh, Scotland, in France, and at the USP University of Sao Paulo, at the Institute of Oceanography. And the objective of this program is having a, a more a close cooperation between these institutions. And this is a very interesting program. Well, let's now talk about the weight of the distribution of students. In light blue, you have the trainee students. And for the dark blue is the national ones. That is the provenience of of the students we have got. In terms of other nationalities, uh, uh, we have a bigger presence of Brazil, which is in dark blue. And then uh, we have Brazil, China, Iran as well, and Mozambique. As you can see that there is a big discrepancy and Brazil has a the greatest representativeness. Now thinking about the distribution of uh, uh, the ones that are, um, they have a degree. So 68% uh, is a Portuguese, Brazilian 15.7. These are the nationality distribution of uh, um, those that have got a degree. Over here, you have another map that shows a number of enrolled students. Um, so they come from all over the world, as you can see. 
Now let's shift gears. Let's talk about the research. Let's now think about the postgrad or work as a whole. Right now, we have over 11,000 students in postgraduation and 400, uh, 382 are foreigners. We have the evolution of this study and it has been favorable. As you can see year over year, it is growing. In 20, uh, 2017, we had 10,136 and now it's moving on. It's growing, it's evolving. With regards to publications and citations, uh, we can see that uh, it was around 20,000 in um, 2017, now 2019, over 23,000. And this way you can see this progression and growth. Now about projects of research financed, and that's a very um, significant number, as you can see, the number of total projects is 590 and 316 were um, uh, for coordinators. And we have 269 participants. And these projects are basically covering all the knowledges, knowledge areas. In terms of the um, financiers, uh, you can see the participation of these institutions that are participation, participating. You have a European program, which is Horizonte, Erasmus as well, and the other ones that were on the screen. Now, I would like to highlight that we have the success of some instruments of the European Products Horizon, Horizon 2020. So we had the ERC Advanced Grant, ERC Starting Grant, ERC Proof of Concept, ERA Chair Project 20, and NB, NMBP, sorry. These are great success cases that are worth, you know, highlighting. Uh, for the size of these instruments that are very important and greatest numbers of investigators we have got are included in that. In terms of international collaborations, we have around 3,000 institutions participating according to, to, the, to, the, to the numbers we have got. 219 institutions come from South America. And of course, this is proportional to the number of collaborations that are given. So the ones that are darker, uh, they are the areas where we have a more intense activity. Over here, we have another diagram talking about the situation in Brazil. These are the institutions in Brazil uh, where we have collaborations. The size of the ball is proportional to the number of publications with institution. And in this figure now, in this image now, you see the number of citations of these publications. And you see it's a substantial part of this country that is covered by this collaboration. Now let's talk about the future. That's I wanted to determine um, we might talk because we always talk about what is the past, but we have to think about the future. And this is what to give us pleasure to be talking about and to discuss in terms of the facts that we can bring to society. <clears throat> One of the most interesting developments we have had in the last years is, uh, is the, um, the clinical investigation um, formation in, Port in Portugal. These are big um, um, structures that would cover hospital centers, healthcare improvement, and also it has the aim of progressing and applying the knowledge in scientific evidence. So that's the objective that we have caught which is to always advance this knowledge such a way that we are going to improve the healthcare 
and also the life of citizens. In general, um, we have some associations, for example, a, uh, organic units of uh, higher education institutes, um, also healthcare service provider units, on top of investigation units as well. And that's where we can have the concentration of research. The clinical academic center that was now formalized that integrates Aveiro University uh, is present in communities of Aveiro, in schools, and IBMED, which is an institute, which is the investigation unit in healthcare that we have got here in Aveiro. It has been very well evaluated in the assessments. In terms of hospital centers, we have Gaia, Feira, and Aveiro. These are the three big cities in the region. And besides that, we have ARS in the northern part and ARS in the central area. They have a very good impact in terms of this clinic academic center. Uh, it's not organized by university. And um, this city has this characteristic of having all this approach, and we are an institution that we really uh, foster integration to bring uh, more and more knowledge in terms of healthcare. And here we converge so many technologies, knowledge, disciplines, and all the barriers that can come, uh, we try to put them down. And because of that, we do not include here the medical schools and other institutions, because in Aveiro, we would have everything here, the social medical departments, but we could also mention some other departments uh, that related to investigation that can be included into the projects and bringing their knowledge. I want to mention the Science and Innovation Park as well. It's close to the University of Aveiro. And for innovation of technological base, we have an incubator for companies and design factory as well. It's the only park in the country that would have a design factory um, department. And the objective is to promote the entrepreneurial spirit. We don't want to form only good students, but good entrepreneurs, citizens with great ideas and build companies, startups, business, and move forward. And this is why there is a way so that they can develop their good ideas. And I believe that it has a great impact on the society. There is something else that um, brings me great pleasure to be talking about the future. It's the partnership with uh, Osvaldo Cruz Foundation and this relationship we have got is really ben beneficial to both sides. We can provide in this partnership, uh, the, which is a great door for industrial dynamic um, uh, environment for entrepreneurs. And it's a region dynamic, a dynamic region for the youth where uh, which is attracted and invited to think in a different way. And together we can work in healthcare, entrepreneurship, in the convergence of many areas of knowledge. And this is why I wrap up saying that the best is still yet to come. And I, I, I'm really willing to make it come true. Thank you so much for your time. And I'm here available for the Q&A session. Thank you so much, Dr. Paulo Ferreira. Thank you for your presentation and for the wide range of opportunities for Fiocruz and other institutions of Brazil for this collaboration network with our country in Latin America. Thank you once again. Now, let's move on in our agenda. And now we have a moderation for the Q and A's. We have some messages through YouTube and our dear colleague from Technological Group, Ana Margarida, 
uh, has already mentioned that we have some messages. She has received two questions. The first one is to Dr. Magali from Dr. Tanaraujo. Dr. Magali, the question is the following. Was there any study carried out about these partnerships in terms with among institutions um, built by the IOC in the 20th century? No, I don't know. We know the partnerships, but they are a specific case. It's more systematized. Um, it's more systematized. We still didn't have a systematized study covering all the partnerships of the 20th century. I don't know. I don't know. I believe we don't have it. I believe that we don't have any systematized uh, research. And in this lack of systematization, we lose information. Because like Pierre Branch that I have just mentioned. Thank you, Magali. Another, another, it's not a question now, but it's a comment from the Embassy of France saying that the Embassy of France reinforced the will to continue cooperating uh, in terms of innovation, health, and technology. It's very important to have this. I've received that from YouTube. We have another question, and then I would like to give the floor to Dr. Jose Paulo and then to Dr. Carlos Jagadella. Carlos, how do you see the diff the technological, technocratic um, challenges you see in the current management that we have got in Brazil before the challenges that you have put to us for the industry 4.0 and the connection between biology and information technology in more flexible, more agile models um, with regards to technology that would demand flexibility and speed in terms of management. How do you see these two points that can initially can be antagonic or even a barrier to this process of advancement and development? Should I start now, Carl? Yes, please. Thank you so much for the question. Well, it's a very relevant question because in fact, we have created a myth and I recommend the reading of Mariana Mafuca, uh, that's their book. We have created a myth that entrepreneurship is only for the private sector. And what we have seen so far with the, with the COVID-19 pandemic, if it was not about for the public research, which is innovative, robust, um, and with a horizon of uncertainty, we would never have reached the vaccine that we have created. I also recommend uh, the, the reading of Faults in Lancet. He shows all the paths of public research that happened behind the um, vaccine that was created for COVID-19 then we should have a public entrepreneurship program. Because if you don't have entrepreneurial government, we won't have a private entrepreneurial sector. If you think about the technological uh, demand that uh, Phil Chris has done, it was not dependent on Misia, our president, but she bought the future. She bought a vaccine in September that could go wrong then we have to bring this possibility to the state, to the government. We have to open courses and actions with the government um, because we have people that have uh, uh, great objectives, but this world of science with uncertainty and getting prepared for uncertainty, for the new, for the mistake, the possible mistakes, and get prepared for the learning. I, I usually say that we cannot limit it or to block the, or, or put the entrepreneur into prison, but we have to put into prison those that are corrupt. This line of thought is critical within Fiocruz and more, the, the uh, regulatory framework um, 
does not help sometimes, but the fear of hiring, the fear of contracting something that is uncertain, the vaccine for the AIDS, for example, we couldn't reach yet. But think about the, the journey of knowledge. We are producing now the vaccine for COVID uh, because we produce uh, uh, biopharmaceuticals that uh, were withdrawn. And of course, this issue is central and it does not depend on Fia Cruz, uh, but Fia Cruz has a legitimacy which is national. And in this grammatical context of COVID-19, everybody's criticizing those that didn't buy vaccine like Fia Cruz did. And we need to have a framework in which the manager will not depend on heroes, but they can go to bed uh, easily when they are innovative, but they are honest as well. I believe this is critical and it's part of an agenda that without innovation in management, we don't have innovation in terms of knowledge and biology and sociology and history, and we are attach it to the past. I believe Sosaldo Cruz um, it can be one of the leading institutions and we are going to decriminalize the government and the manager, of course, on behalf of innovation. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you so much. If you allow me, um, there's another question here. Dr. Paulo, we have a question with regards to the new European program to foster innovation and technology. On your visa, and what are the perspectives of this new European program that is starting this year and will go into 2027, specifically related to healthcare investments in healthcare? You have the floor. Thank you for the question. Naturally, these um, create problems that are based on structure and. Um, People were questioning me that, but to have a risk uh, in terms of the equal value of consumption. And I believe that the experience like this one with the pandemic, they have confirmed something that we already knew about, which is science, science is not something that we shouldn't see that as a public or something applicable. So there are things that are useful today and there are some things that will be useful in the future. But when we think about incentive systems for the long term in terms of science and knowledge, it's a great risk. And I really hope that this um, program uh, can be protest uh, and for resilience, we need to have uh, investigation because investigation is one of the less useful areas today, but we need to have resilience for tomorrow with this. Thank you, Professor Paolo for your answer. Dr. Jose Paolo, please have the floor. Agora sim, obrigado. É, bom, prazer vê-lo novamente aqui. É, It's a pleasure to see you once again here, Professor Paulo Ferreira. Thank you for your presentation on the University of Aveiro. I'd like to thank you once again for the opportunities to the IOC and Phil Cruz within an innovative project. So, Thank you very much, Professor Paulo Ferreira, for this opportunity. When we mention names, we always end up forgetting someone. In my initial talk, I forgot to thank Carlos Eduardo Rocha Cadu. I really, really have to thank him for all the work he conducted initially at PAP and now at the International Cooperation. So thank you very much. I apologize for not mentioning you before. I'd like to make a general comment related to the presentations from Magali and Carlos Gadelha. Magali 
your presentation was excellent. I already talked to Marli and Ademir to see if we can organize a center of studies because it's totally connected with the collaborations and structures developed by Fiocruz. You mentioned the Antarctica very properly. And now the commander from the Marine organized the meeting at Fiocruz with the president Nisi and a few members of the board from Fiocruz talking about the Agua Azul project, which really opens new possibilities and is totally connected to our origins. You also mentioned very well the issue of the barge. Now we have an electronic microscopy platform. And just Chila Combi has built a connection. And with the vice president of biological connections, Manuela, and our directors, and biological collection. Uh, lab, we have rescued this collection of barnacles, and now they're ready. We can seed them to the National Museum. We are going to do it right before the fire. So it was good that we did not know, but it's perhaps the only collection of barnacles in the world. And putting it together with the excellent and reflexive talk by Carlos Gadelha, the industry has a very important role with regard to the liberation of uh, resources. And I'd also like to mention the following, beginning with an institutional development program, which was the PDTSP, the Technological Development Program for Public Health. Inside the institution of collaborations, we created specific labs focused on the research of viruses in the environment. At IOC, we have two labs, the lab of com uh, compared uh, environmental biology. And Carlos has talked about the basic conditions. Uh, we need water to wash our hands and sanitation. And the pioneer work done in Brazil involving IOC and the ESP, Camille Ferreira, and the Compared Virology Lab conducted by Marisi has shown in a partnership with the City Hall of Niterói the importance of sanitation. Niterói has more than 90% of sewage networks in the municipality. So we were able to map the dispersion of SARS-CoV-2 in Niterói and adopting preventive actions related to public health because in the sewage, networks, we could detect the virus before it was actually circulating uh, more strongly in the population. So we can uh, define prevention measures. These are innovative actions. One of the examples is a Innova project, which was developed during the ruling of uh, President Tunisia. So we should think about these actions Think about what we can do to implement improvements in healthcare focused on the environment and, of course, related to uh, animals. I'd like to congratulate Professor Paulo Ferreira, Magali, and Carlos Gadelha for their brilliant presentations and contributions, which were very important. Tomorrow, we have a very important panel with Mauricio Zuma from Biomanguinhos will talk about the whole competence of bio and the development of a new platform for the production of vaccines for Oxford, AstraZeneca, and Fucruz with the director president of the Putanta Institution, uh, Dumas Covas, who will talk about the innovative platform, an LP3 platform to work with uh, SARS-CoV-2. And then we have the inactivated vaccine such as the one developed by Butantan in partnership with China. And Luis Davidovic, president of the um, Brazilian Academy of Science, will talk about the importance of investing in science, technology, and innovation. I apologize for my uh, comments. They took some time, but I believe it's important to mention. Thank you, Cadu. Thank you, Zé Paulo. I received a few more comments here from YouTube. And it's also important to mention the following. 
to Dr. Carlos Gadelia. We're saying many uh, thanks for your presentation and congratulations on the content one from Marcia Casemiro, saying your presentation was brilliant and you emphasize the importance of the sovereignty of knowledge under the optics of health and development. I'd like to leave you with that information. This came from YouTube. Other colleagues sent uh, greetings and thanks to Professor Koldas. Many comments and comments from Dr. Paulo Guzzo, the coordinator of uh, Phil Cruz Center, congratulating the panelists for the opening panel. Dr. Tânia Araújo Jorge made another comment talking about the University of Aveiro, the cooperation with the UA, congratulating Professor Paulo Ferreira, the Dean. And she said the partnership with the University of Aveiro is creating huge expectations amongst our scientific community. And talking about the cooperation with Aveiro, Claudia Canio is asking Professor Paulo to please comment a little bit more on the connectivity and connection between industry, university, and uh, how things work in Portugal, and which areas the professor considers have more potential for collaboration between Fio Cruz and the University of Aveiro, and also about Aveiro, José Cordeiro talks about the international platform, IOC, Fio Cruz, and the UA, already in Aveiro, reinforcing the great support this initiative is receiving from the university. So thank you, Professor Paulo. You have the floor. Feel free to make your comments. Can I speak now? Thank you very much. The relationship with the industry is extremely important to us. We have been approaching it in an integrated manner. Integration is the key word here. The mission of the university is information and every level should be involved. For example, we have a center of science and the mission is captivating young people and bringing them into science. We are able to conquer young people making them love science. That's important. They should be aware of the importance of science and knowledge. We do hope the young people will learn to love science and technology. And we have a generation of people who are being prepared to change the world. This is part of our mission. When you go to a school and see kids who are six years old, you do not expect any immediate results for your efforts, of course. And now during the academic life of the students, uh, they are being prepared to expose their ideas and to acquire a pragmatic view of knowledge. As I said before, I am quite convinced that we should never leave aside any areas of knowledge. They are all extremely important. We cannot forget any areas of knowledge. Otherwise, our uh, future will be less resilient. So I believe we need to prepare citizens, not only competent professionals. We need people who are willing to work and to have influences from different areas who are willing to approach complex problems and have ideas to help change and improve the world. Our study programs expose our students to these realities, exposing them to other colleagues, other cultures. The architecture of the university helps with that. Civil engineering is in front of uh, uh, industrial engineering and tourism. All the students from all areas are close, so they are constantly in touch. This is very important to form personalities and to promote the exchange of experience between our students. And during the last stages of the course, we should give tools to those who have ideas so they can establish their own companies or so they can work with the ideas and values they have learned. This is extremely important. If we can uh, steer our activity like that, we'll contribute to a stronger region, and then we will be challenged to work on more challenging projects, focusing on research, 
from the viewpoint of project, that's the idea. We work strongly with the region. Internationalization is an important tool because we will have nothing of value to offer to the region if in the global stage of knowledge we do not prove that we are competitive and that we are among the best. That's why the local relationship and local immersion, in my opinion, should always be complemented by a global dimension because it's in the global stage that we compete, that we learn, and that's where we will have uh, lessons, teachings, and values so we can leverage our actions. So making it very short, this is how I see the relations uh, with the rest of the world. This project is not only of the university. It is, we have companies, local authorities involved, small, medium-sized, and huge companies are involved, and the whole project was co-developed with all these actors. Thank you, Professor Paulo. Thank you very much for your explanations. Now I'll give the floor to Dr. José Paulo so he can make his final comments. We do not have any questions on the chat. And if we receive any questions from YouTube, we will automatically send these questions to the speaker. I would also like to thank Dr. Jonas Perales, our Vice Director of Research and Technological Development and Innovation of IOC for the space and for the support given to the whole team, which is part of this commission. Jose Paulo, I will give you the floor so we can close the first panel. This afternoon at 2 p.m., we will have the second panel, which is the strategy of international cooperation for innovation and health. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Paulo Ferreira. Thank you very much for your availability and partnership. Dr. Carlos Gadelha, thank you very much once more for your excellent presentation. Dr. Magali, thank you very much. Seeing you again was a pleasure. Dr. Paulo, you have the floor. No. Well, Cadu, I would like once more to thank Dr. Magali, Dr. Carlos Gadelha, Professor Paulo Ferreira, the Dean of the University of Aveiro for their presence here. And I'd like to congratulate the organization and all the people involved in the organization and broadcasting of this event for this extremely rich um, morning, the reflections we remain with are the following. Science, technology, and innovation is not a, an expenditure, it's investment. It should be a government policy, regardless of the government. It is a government policy. I believe the University of Aveiro and the government of Portugal are showing that very clearly how, in how they invest in the University of Aveiro. It's an innovative institution. And I believe it's a good example. And good examples should be followed. This uh, great example from Aveiro should serve as inspiration to us so we can have a government policy. In Brazil, we already had the University of Brasilia with this spirit. Unfortunately, all that got lost. After that, we had the Federal University of ABC with a similar type of spirit. However, all that should be consolidated in Brazil. Governments should think and understand that investing in science and technology means more uh, a better health level, more social and economic development, focusing on issues related to one health, public health, animal sanitation, and the environment. Thank you very much. This is what I had to say. Thank you, everyone. I'd like to thank all the, our participants and all our colleagues who are here. Thank you very much. See you in the second panel this afternoon. Thank you.